There it is. Looks like you've got some kind of zombie takeout in there or something. Welcome to Zombie Takeout, the Be Moving Cult Movie Show. I'm John. Hello, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's movie, we've got a voicemail from Bodo. Bodo here, good news. I am now negative. So back to work I go. Still got little headaches and stuff like that. Lungs hurt a little bit, but besides that, I'm feeling great. House 2, my gosh. Kind of fun. Uh, good stop motion animation uh puppetry with a lot to be desired storyline what the hell is that uh john mayer reminding everybody why he never needs to act ever uh Waxenberger, boy he storms onto that screen and he just takes over for the maybe 15 20 minutes he's on there absolutely wonderful and the most important star of the whole show Kane Hodder. Without any makeup, it's a pleasure to see him like that. I mean, the man is a legend. Anyway, I would give this more than I did the other one. I would give it three and a half. I enjoyed it. You guys keep up the great work. Talk to you later. Bye. Thank you, Bodo. I'm glad to hear your negative. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, I think maybe when you said John Mayer, you meant Bill Maher. I think I think John Mayer would have been a, an improvement. Mm-hmm. Although I mean, it's not Mars fault. Well, <laughs> I mean, Mars character is named Mars character is named John, so that might have been what why the wires crossed. I mean, I agree with you in general about Bill Maher. We'll get to that later. Um, <laughs> slight correction. Uh, unfortunately, Rassenberger is only on screen for maybe ten minutes. Yeah. 20 would have been amazing um remember what i said last week i think that was on that was during the episode mm. the only thing i remember about this movie is john <laughs> ratzenberger just stealing oh. the show and he did for 10 and minutes and then i found out that it was 10 minutes out of an hour and 30 minute slog yeah um <laughs> oh and and for those who don't know kane hodder is best known for playing jason Voorhees in the friday third friday the 13th movies oh okay um he was the guy in the gorilla suit that got punched over the rally. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. So on to this week's movie, which is from 1987. House 2, the second story, continuing what is now our house quadrilogy. We're doing awful rhythm. And of course, <laughs> that brings us to the impromptu plot summary, sponsored by the late 80s. Seriously, what the fuck were we thinking? And also brought to you by Bill Tower, electrician and adventurer. Though, he's probably not going to fix your electricity. At least not on Little League night. All right, so, um, (laughs) and of course, I'm like, are are you sure you want to do all four before we (laughs) start the episode (laughs) tonight? Um, Next one looks like a really good, legit horror movie. I've never seen the other two. Uh, I have and, seen these two. And four is going to be abysmal, but it'll be fun to tear it apart. Um, <laughs> so we have um, a completely different cast of characters and a completely different cow- house of this one from the first one. Um, it's not clear who all of these people are to each other, although it begins with this couple who live in this big house who, for some reason, have to give up their kid for adoption. Mm-hmm. And in a rush, yeah, in a rush, they have to give up their kid for adoption. It's never explained, and honestly, it doesn't matter. This mm-hmm. whole the whole first half hour of this movie is just an utter waste of time. All but ten minutes of this movie is a complete and utter waste of time. <laughs> well, well, we'll get to that in the review. But let me just mm-hmm. thumb up the plot summary. So they give up for adoption, and then as soon as they give him up for adoption, they're confronted by this ghost from the Old West who guns them down. Um, he's looking for a crystal skull. The crystal skull, however, is buried with his old uh, partner uh, in his grave that uh, 
his great grandson who moves into this house, our hero of the film, um, starts studying up on this crystal skull for some reason. I'm not even, I, I don't remember why mm-hmm. exactly it captured his attention. It was in a few books. Yeah, he was looking at he's... pictures of his parents. It turns out he was the kid who was being given away at the beginning. Yes. He was the kid who's being given away at the beginning, and yes, that's his great great grandfather, or great grandfather, or great great grandfather, or something like that. <laughs> great great. He, uh, great great. So that he uh, he realizes that it's most likely buried with him. So he does what any uh, sane and rational person would do, and digs up his great great grandfather, <laughs> uh, who turns out to be alive from the Chris powers of the crystal skull. And uh, he talks a lot about the Old West with them and uh, knows, seems to know how the Old West is portrayed in modern media somehow, even despite being underground. Well, he was underground <laughs> and he went under in 1910-ish. Yes. Or, or, or thereabouts, because it was 70 years. This was 80, actually 16, because this was 70 years. He watched TV for a few hours and understood exactly how... Uh, the West is being portrayed mm-hmm. uh, in media at the time. Yeah. Uh, he then, of course, you know, tells them all about how it really was. And then we have a string of what seemed to be out of work professional wrestlers mm-hmm. steal the, um, the, uh, the crystal it's skull. Uh, they, of course, each time they, they go into another dimension to bring it back, they bring in a creature or two with them from each dimension until they have this whole um, interdimensional fam. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just as they're going in one last one, uh, they an electrician shows up. It's hardly even, of course, relevant to the plot, but he, he mm-hmm. does kind of bail them out because he is a professional adventurer. Mm-hmm. And uh, then, of course, finally, after all the other fake shumps are done, the uh, the gunslinger returns, and of course he is the heavy, but he does not have the personality of a Richard Mall. <laughs> he just kind of grunts like Frankenstein, and says a few words at random, and uh, hilarity ensues. And as soon as I saw Ari Gross's name in the credits, I knew this is going to be more of a comedy than a horror movie. <laughs> I'm not wasn't really familiar with him. Like, I think he, was he like a regular? He's done a lot of TV work, a lot of very like sitcommy late comedy stuff. Um, and he he was sent away as an infant. I'm kind of wondering how he recognizes his parents once he's looking through the books. <laughs> right? Yeah, there's a lot of the story that really just makes no sense. Mm. And I have to, I never talk about the music surprisingly in movies, but I just have to, one thing just stuck out to me. <laughs> Simmons' electronic drums really don't work in a horror score. No. <laughs> it was right before the ironing board gag. You get this, you know, organ y sort of, you know, patch, you know, dark and eerie, and this, this random, you know, be, random hits on these Simmons pads. Think 80s, elect- 80s synth drums. Those are some fads. Uh, it, it's just really broke the mood. Uh, right. I mean, and I thought we were, I was still on board. I was I was happy with the ironing board shtick because I was like, oh, you know, it's like the old Tom and Jerry thing. You know, the other one was kind of a Bugs Bunny thing. And we're going to get some more of that in this one. Mm-hmm. And, um, well, the problem is, you know, the last one, they spent about 20 minutes, you know, investing in the characters mm-hmm. and and pretty much giving us their backstory. And it's kind of slow, but it pays off in the end because yeah. it's a key part of the story <laughs> of the house taking advantage, trying to take advantage of our hero right. and winning. Here, none of the backstory mattered. Hmm. No, nothing was used again. The girlfriend or wife or whatever that was, they didn't even really explain who she was to him, mm-hmm. was irrelevant because she just leaves and never comes back because her boss told her that she he's sitting with another girl at a party. <laughs> I mean, it was just ridiculous. I, I'm said that the Simmons drums broke the mood. 
I, I'm being a little disingenuous because there really wasn't a mood to break. Um, no, no, there was not. I couldn't decide which couple who, between the two that lived there was more annoying. That was the other thing. The other characters in the first one were, were likable, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, the, the nosy neighbor, as nosy as he mm-hmm. was, turned out to be like, you know, George Dwight Dwight had his best interest <laughs> in his part. Yeah. And here it's just kind of like, uh all right, whatever. But they were, um, they were exhuming the, a corpse, and I was bored. Yes, yes, it was pretty boring, even up to them when they were exhuming a corpse. The one thing that was kind of freaking me out, uh, uh, from in the beginning, that had my attention that I could not let go. Jonathan Stark hmm. was that who Jim Carrey modeled his Dumb and Dumber character off of? Oh, could have been. I don't know the year on Dumb and Dumber, so. It was like 93, 94. Oh, okay, very, very possible then. They were very similar. I mean, he had the same haircut almost. The mm-hmm. only thing was missing was the chip tooth. Yeah, yeah. Was, and he did like, you know, a lot of goofiness here too, mm-hmm. but of course yeah. not Jim Carrey level goofiness. Well, it's kind of like uh, Will Arnett's character on Arrested Development, but more annoying. Yes. Um, that's kind of the character. Um, also, when they exhume the corpse, he pops up, he's wearing this... What I describe as a skeletal Dr. Zayas mask. <laughs> I was very relieved when it just turned out to be a mask that Gramps right. was wearing. Yeah. Dr. Zayas. <laughs> it looked like a skeletal Dr. Zayas. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of great, great Gramps, he drove incredibly well for someone who'd been in the ground for 70 years. And who had only ridden horseback. Yeah. yeah. Um, also, one thing I did was impressed by, there was a comment on the ozone layer, and ozone you know, in the environment, in in the 87 movie, that was nice. Yeah, we were talking about the ozone a bit here. I mean, of course, it was a character that had, I mean, he was just talking about words that he heard on the news yeah, yeah, kind of right. thing, no. which was realistic. Yeah, yeah. Now, I watched this on Tubi. Um, Same here. I have to comment on an ad. I never do this, but... Ice T was doing a car shield ad. <laughs> yeah, minus John Ratzenberger, it was like one of the most interesting things that yeah, happened yeah. while we were watching this. <laughs> and and just Bill Maher, uh, I'm I'm only, I'm beginning to realize just how eminently punchable Bill Maher is whenever I see him on screen. <laughs> I mean, he was actually uh, he was probably the second best actor in this, though, if you think about it, because. He was playing an asshole. I, well, I yeah. could just picture I mean, him wasn't talking really about. I could picture him talking about the kind of guy that he was playing. You know, the guy who runs to the person's girlfriend who wants to, you know, sleep with that girl, mm-hmm. of course, and was looking for a reason to break the two of them up. Mm-hmm. So yeah. he's uh, he's punchable, of course, and, mm-hmm. and he does his job well. I mean, he was just kind of being himself, but you know. It's good casting, I suppose. Um, yeah. I also appreciate the Reagan jokes, um, you know, being, you know, of that age. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Oh, oh right, right. The uh, the Western guy yeah, yeah, talking yeah. about. Yeah. Grant Gramps, Gramps was talk- talking was, about. You know, talking about uh, Reagan being a wimp. <laughs> but at 30 minutes in, I have the note, where is Ratzenberger? I was promised Ratzenberger. <laughs> My, I think around the same time I go, I thought the first one took a long time to get going. <laughs> it my, probably the same part. You know, it was about a half hour in. Mm-hmm. Um, the Stone Age guy, of course, has a long knife. Uh-huh. I, I did appreciate this professional wrestler cameo and how a jungle materialized upstairs that basically turned into a wrestling match. Yeah. And then, you know, they're, he was, but he fell out of the tree in the jungle and he falls through the full the, the jungle floor back into the house. That was that was amusing. Right. If they just could have kept, I mean, because the premise of house is great. I mean, mm-hmm. the whole dimension or interdimensional thing going on instead of just a haunted house. Yeah. And they, there's so much they could have done here. Yeah. Although I have in my notes, OMG, they killed Thog, you bastards. <laughs> Old what? TAS reference. <laughs> um, on the positive side, uh, I also got a kick out of the, the caterpillar puppy. You did? 
It's this giant, you know, animatronic caterpillar with a puppy face. It was cute. Um, I was just kind of like, really? <laughs> also, there's a scene where Charlie, um, Jonathan Stark's character, is sleeping with a plastic hollow wiffle ball bat. Like, he thinks he's going to protect himself with it. That's his, his defense, yeah. yeah. Um, 59.30, nearly an hour into an hour, a nearly hour and a half movie, Radzenberger yeah. shows up. <laughs> I think my favorite part, one of my favorite parts of his scene is 10 minutes. And it's funny how much we can spend on his 10 minutes yeah. of the film. Oh, yeah. But neither of them ask Ratzenberger where he gets his, got his sword from. No, no. He um, just walks in with the sword. I mean, of course, you know, we see him take it out, but they don't. Oh, yeah, I, I love that. He's just, he kneel, you know, they're, they're gab- grabbing their, you know, little, um, almost like toy swords that they have. He yeah. opens his case, has this, like, beautiful, like, pristine saber. <laughs> Gold handle. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of doing a milder version of the Cliff accent. Right. I actually it watched... It would have been better if he had just came in with the mailman uniform yeah. and stuff. Because mm-hmm. I watched an interview with him. Uh, I paused the movie just to hear his actual natural voice. Yeah. He, he's from Connecticut. He has a little bit of a Northeast accent, but obviously nothing like Cliff. He's right. kind of like half-assing it in the movie. Um, the accent. Not the performance and at all. Um, I, I loved when he, he pulled on the wire, it broke the wall, and he just kept pulling it. <laughs> I also love how when they're in the uh, the tunnel and they're they're looking at the scene, he just looks annoyed the whole time. Yeah. They're like trying to take the lead. Uh-huh. <laughs> he has this face of just like the fuck. Just I, I just he has this look. The it's just the this fuck my life look on his face when they. Right. I think it was when they were when they stopped the sacrifice. <laughs> he just looks down like oh fuck my life. <laughs> But before then, he has the best line in the movie, possibly the only good line in the movie. He breaks through the wall because he was pulling on the on the cable. It broke through the wall. And he says, and it's this big hole leading to this, you know, jungle. Looks like he got some kind of alternative uni- universe in there or something. <laughs> Just in the typical repairman kind of way. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You ever see one of those? Eight when that happens. Hmm. But yeah, it's it's a glorious ten minutes of the film, and then the heavy showed up. Well, wait a minute. One last thing about Ratzenberger's thing. I looked it up. Um, Culver Studios, now Amazon Studios, is at ninety three thirty six Washington Boulevard. Oh, okay. In Culver City, California. Hmm. Although for some reason they have it as Highland, California, huh. which I'm not sure why. But then that's on the... his card. Yeah. <laughs> The heavy shows up and they get into a gunfight. Um, and like the main character, Ari Gross's character, I can't think of his name offhand. Oh, Jesse. Um, shoots um, Slim in the head. Basically shoots his head off. And I'm thinking, if Slim is undead, why does he need a head? <laughs> and I was right. He came back without the head. <laughs> now, I mean, if they were going with the physics of the first one, that actually would have worked. Because... The first one, you could kill them with the shotgun. Mm, yeah. Uh, that's true. That's true. Um, and how would Gramps know who killed his ma and pa? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, there is, by the way, a little bit of trivia. There is one connection to the previous one. Dwyer oh, really? Brown, who played William Katz's lieutenant, Roger's lieutenant in the Vietnam flashbacks, in this one played um, Clarence, the father. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, of course, you know, he, he eventually defeats Slim and he goes and he buries the grandfather because, you know, they, I guess now that Slim is dead, you know, the magic keeping the grandfather alive is no more. And I'm deducting, um, I'm deducting uh, a half a brain for this. Mm. He, he doesn't bury the fucking skull. I was just getting to that. He leaves the skull as a grave marker. That was has to have been the dumbest thing I've seen in this whole movie. Yeah. yeah. That, that's it's, saying a lot. <laughs> it seems like a nice small sequel, but they knew damn well there wasn't going to be a sequel. Right. So, yeah. Sequels and remakes. Sequels and remakes. 
It was followed by two sequels, House 3 and House 4. We'll be reviewing both of them. Um, the next one, also not a direct sequel to the original. 4 is a direct sequel to the original. Yeah, so we, we get to see Cat again. Yeah. And on to Brains. On to Brains. Like I said, I actually I think I mentioned these off air. Ratzenberger more than doubled the rating. I get, he earned it a one and a half, so it's a two and a half for me. Uh, I was going to give it a two. Ratzenberger gives it one, but mm. I'm deducting half for the skull being left out in the open after it being the MacGuffin. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we're left at two. All right. <laughs> and what have we learned? We uh, learned that you either quit while you're ahead or you bring in more Ratzenberger. And I learned that crystal skulls should be avoided at all costs. They never lead to anything good. It leads to bad cinema. Mm-hmm. You know, I've never seen that Indiana Jones movie, actually. Neither have I, but, I mean, I, I, I've heard enough to know I don't want to. Right. I. It's kind of strange, because, you know, I like the other ones as, you know, warts and all. Mm-hmm. All right, that's it for House 2. Until next time, we'll be continuing the quadrilogy with House 3, the horror we'll show. end the episode with, thank you, sir, may I have another? <laughs> Always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are. Well.